Hi, hello everyone. This is the first time I have a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how it works. Uh, so before I start, I would like to uh, try to see if it works. I want to say that I'm a co-author of a patent of uh, the model that is going to be commercialized soon. Uh, and as well, I would like to thank uh, the Humane Society. I think I put the wrong name in the video, sorry. <laughs> and, and the organizers of the meeting for inviting me here. So the story I'm going to tell, uh, as we all have uh, this guy in our heads, I don't know if he's working, it's supposed to be a video, but it's not working. But, uh, this is uh, maybe a slow computer. Anyway, so what uh, we were interested in to is not going to work. So we were interested in to uh, develop uh, a brain uh, organ or model, uh, but as well uh, we work in, in toxicology. So in our case, we need to find a commitment between complexity and reproducibility. Right? There's many uh, models now uh, in the, that people are publishing that. Some cases it's really uh, difficult to get reproducible um, uh, models every time you produce them. So we were trying to focus more in the reproducibility of the system. So a few years ago, we get some money from uh, NCAT. Uh, this was part of a human achieved project. This project was uh, uh, from NIH, FDA, and ARPA. And we were three groups, uh, uh, School of Medicine at Joe Hawkins University, Bloomberg School of Public Health, and Kennedy Craig Institute. The three of them were in John Hopkins University. And this project, probably you guys know, is really, is really famous. Uh, the idea was to develop uh, uh, different uh, 3D models uh, to incorporate in uh, microfluid platforms in order to uh, determine uh, toxicity effects in, in humans, to predict toxi toxicity in humans. Um, so we got a few, most of the money was from Harvard and MIT. And we got some money to try to develop a, a, a brain. So uh, we call human brain microphysiological system. However, now it's a really like uh, other um, presenters were mentioned before. There's uh, a little bit of controversy of what is what definition. So, but in that point, NIH defined microphysiological systems as, as a multicellular 3D, 3D culture that represents a functional part of an organ. So that's what we were trying to do in that point. Uh, so uh, what we do is uh, mainly we, we got uh, um, a different uh, fibroblasts from different donors and then we make the reprogram to IPSCs and then from that point we will try to do like a 3D model that we could incorporate in the, in the platforms and then in order to predict uh, uh, toxicology or neurotoxicology in our case. So we do the analysis, we make sure that we have a really nice uh, Markers and then we differentiate neuroprogenitors. And from the neuroprogenitors, we use a, a shaker to do the. There's another video that is remember. But uh, we did. <laughs> this is a simple shaker. So we just use a shaker uh, to produce the, uh, the spheres. Uh, so in this stage, they are neuroprogenitors, and then we keep them in differentiation for eight weeks uh, all together. So they are differentiated all together. It's so terrible, I cannot put the video. This was a nice video that I wanted to show. Uh, I'm oh, sorry, guys. I have a really bad night, as you can see in my eye. Well, mainly what we obtain is, uh, is a spheres um, that have a different uh, cell, cell, uh, central nervous system populations. Uh, we have a uh, oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, uh, different neural cell types. And, and the idea for us was to make sure that we have all the time same population. Oh, that's working. Oh, maybe not. No, it's not working. A real slow. A little bit slow. Don't worry. All right, so what I was saying is for us, it was really important to make sure that every time we produce the, the model, we have the same population, right? And then as well, we did uh, some studies to see which population we have in this system. And, and we did some stainings for astrocytes, as a GFP, or Purkinje cells, uh, calvining, uh, 
we have an all air uh, market. Uh, we were really focusing uh, after Ogia 2. We didn't want to have only neuronal uh, population because for toxicology, it's really important to have the supportive cells, astrocytes or oligodendrocytes, that will add to the uh, toxicology effects. So, as well, we found uh, a really high myelination of the axons. I'm going to show a little bit more in like uh, we did uh, O1 for oligodendrocytes, and we can see how the oligodendrocytes are duplicated over the angle. So, uh, like I say, uh, we did a different stainless to see that we have different polynetic with amateur neurons and so on. As well, we try to quantify how many exercises, how many oligodendrocytes, how many neurons we have every time we do the same experiment. And that's really important because, like I say, for neurotoxicology, you have to have all the time the same one. So we did uh, by uh, high content imaging and confocal images, we quantify the uh, oligodendrocytes and the astrocytes. We have around 20% astrocytes and 10% oligodendrocytes every time we do this model. And uh, we did as well flow cytometry to make sure that we have all the time the same population. We repeat several times experiments. And, and we can see that the, the standard deviation is not so high in the latest states. We characterize with different gene markers, gene markers, but I'm not gonna go too deep on that because it's a little bit boring and it's already published. So as well, uh, as I say, for us, it was really important uh, to use the, the shaker in our case because we want to control the size. So as I was saying, we want to have every time the same shape, same size, and same composition to be able to predict toxicology, right? Because if you are gonna do different treatments and some aggregates are bigger than on the other ones or some have more astrocytes, then the readout will be different for the different chemicals. So here we did different experiments and, and after uh, several tries, we, we make sure that we have around 300, 350 microns uh, SVS. And this is really important because organoids that are high, uh, bigger than 500 microns, sometimes they got a necrotic sentence. And the necrotic centers, for some research, is not important, but for toxicology, it's really important because if you have cells that are dying, you are not going to know if it's because of toxic or if because of our hormone, right? So we were really trying to, to get something that it will be useful for, for our purpose. And as well, we did some electrical, uh, uh, electrophysiological activity. We used an uh, action uh, platform. And now we're trying to work more with EPA to try to develop uh, better our model and see which uh, neurotransmitters and uh, receptors we have. Um, something that we found really interesting is uh, that we could uh, obtain 40% uh, of myelinate, uh, myelinating axons. And myelination has been a really big problem, not only in toxicology, but in several diseases. And it's really hard to get myelinating axons in 2D or in, in vitro models. So that could be something interesting to study yeah, for developmental neurotoxicology. So for that, we use um, Kerman uh, software to, to identify, to quantify the myelin, and as well with we some electron microscopy to prove that uh, there was a real wrapping of the axon. So here's just a section of axon, and you can see the wrapping around the uh, So we have several uh, projects right now. Uh, this is some of the projects that I'm, I'm running. This is uh, something we are doing in our lab, but I'm not doing anything. So this is another PI. Uh, but today I'm gonna try to focus on the developmental neurotoxicity uh, because it's our main research. But I will talk a little bit about virus infection and cancer research. So um, this has been already mentioned, but it's a big concern that the chemical, the environmental exposure to environmental chemicals can be increasing uh, the developmental disorders problems that we are finding right now. So there is an uh, increase of developmental disorders and some evidence uh, indicating that that might be because of environmental exposure. Uh, this, uh, so one in six children uh, between 2000 and 2008 were uh, di diagnosed with some kind of developmental disabilities. That are mainly due for autism spectrum or attention deficit or hyperactivity. And why is that? The, the problem that we have right now in, in the chemical, so when a chemical goes to the market, have to pass like several tests, and then they are classified if it's bad or good, produce cancer or not. But the problem is for developmental neurotoxicity, there is no uh, an efficient test. So in all the years that we have been doing uh, um, developmental neurotoxicity, only 13 chemicals have been 
identify as a produced developmental neurotoxicity effects, right? This is really a small, if we compare to more than 100,000 chemicals that we have in our chemical universe right now. And why is that? Because to do a one single chemical, we need 1,400 rats, and we need to spend $1 million, and it's about two years. So if you take 100,000 chemicals, and you have to spend $1 million for each chemical, that's a lot of money, and it's impossible to do. So, so how normally chemicals are detected in development and neurotoxicity, right? We found first a chemical that is affecting neurotoxicity, right? And then we find out slowly that this chemical was affecting as well uh, children population or the development of, of the fetus. And this is a, this called the silent pipe pandemic, and this is why many people are thinking that these diseases are increasing right now in our society. So David Roll say, um, this is the former director of the NAEHS. He says, if that if thalidomide had caused a 10 point loss of intelligence, portion instead of obvious with the first. So it means that if you have seen only like a, a small reduction of uh, uh, inter coefficient, you will never have detected that there was a developmental neurotoxica. We only detect that because we see that, you know, there were defects in the limbs of the babies. So there's a concern, big concern that many chemicals right now that are, we are exposed are affecting the development of the brains of our kids. Hey, can you, can you? I'm sorry, uh, she's told me to be closer. So, <laughs> so this is actually a, a current uh, paradigm shift, and we are trying to move from uh, crazy uh, studies in, in rats with a lot of rats and money and time to more uh, efficient and more directly to humans uh, test. So what we are trying to develop in, in my center, that is the Center for Alternative Animal Testing, is methods that can predict uh, developmental neurotoxicity or neurotoxicity. So I'm going to talk about one example. This is the first chemical we were trying to use. Uh, we select rotinone. Rotinone, it, it was uh, a really wide use uh, house insecticide and has shown that uh, produce uh, degeneration of the dopamine energy neurons similar to Parkinson's, right? So it's a chemical that is known to produce neurotoxicity and the, neurotoxicity, the mechanism is well known. It's produced uh, effect in the mitochondria complex one and that produces oxidative stress and then that's why we saw uh, the, the death of the dopamine neurons. So what we wanted to see if this chemical was as well a developmental neurotoxica and we choose this one because the, the mechanism is known so we could test our system and see if we can predict similar toxicity. So the first thing we did uh, is a typical uh, viability assay but we decide, our protocol is eight weeks, right? So we decided to choose different windows of exposure to try to see if the differentiation of the cells or the cell population that we have in each stage might affect the toxicity of the, of the model. And as uh, you can see here, at two weeks, we see more... No, no, at two weeks, you see that it's more sensitive than four weeks, than at eight weeks, right? We did as well oxidative stress assay because uh, cell growth production is one of the main uh, things that protein is producing. And we saw as well an increase, higher increase of raw production at, at two weeks and at four weeks and less than at eight weeks. And if we took mitochondria function, we saw as well that two weeks were more sensitive than eight weeks. So for some reason, uh, these chemicals that are supposed to be uh, only neurotoxic and we have seen high sensitivity in the early stage, and that might indicate that these chemicals as well are developmental and neurotoxic. Uh, all right, so the only thing we did is we did uh, microarrays and uh, extracellular metabolites because we were trying to find omics approaches to determine the mechanisms in the future. So we want to use rotinone as a kind of proof of concept that we can predict similar pathways. And then when we do an unknown chemical, we can see if we can predict the same. So the first thing, uh, as you can see, we did the same thing. To for, we, we choose a concentration that was non cytotoxic. Right, that's how normally you do in toxicology. Um, and then as you see, in two, in two weeks we didn't see much change change. Uh, however, in eight weeks many genes were changed. And this is uh, kind of interesting because in, in toxicology sometimes people say, you see more genes, then it's more toxic. However, sometimes if we have proof, if you have less uh, genes, doesn't mean that it's uh, less toxic. Uh, we did the um, KEF pathway analysis. We choose the chemicals that were more uh, significant change. 
And in four and a weeks, we found more than a balance. And if we go to the uh, case weight highways analysis, um, the only difference we saw in two weeks, well, first in two weeks, we didn't see many pathways modified. And we put this aside because you only have neuroprogenitors, then, then some of the pathways are not active yet. Well, when you start four weeks and eight weeks, we see uh, different pathways related with uh, glutamatergic neurons differentiation, dopaminergic neuron differentiation, so on, starting appearing, and that's why they are modified. However, we see the P53 signaling pathway was modified to this, indicating it might be still uh, some uh, change in the cell uh, cycle. Uh, we start doing as well extracellular metabolites. This is a nice method because you don't have to sacrifice your cells, so you can do multiplex analysis of different points. You can measure this and use the aggregates for other things. Uh, interestingly, um, we found that, uh, well, first we see that it was really different um, profile at uh, two weeks, four weeks, and eight weeks. So the cells are releasing different metabolites, and it's probably because they have different phenotypes. Um, but as well, we found that were more metabolites modified at uh, two weeks and four weeks and eight weeks. So op opposite to the micro rays uh, that we found. Really nice, uh, we found that um, at two weeks uh, and four weeks and eight weeks, the main uh, pathway that was modified was mitochondria function. So mitochondria is the, the cause of protein on exposure. Um, if we go to um, developmental function, we saw as well more molecules modify at two weeks and four weeks and eight weeks. And we, have, we, we still need to prove it, but we have the feeling that it's because the astrocytes are trying to uh, reduce the toxicity effects in our model. We did as well target approach, I'm not gonna go to this in a little way, but just to prove that the metabolites we measure were right, because when you do a target approach, you are not 100% sure that your metabolites are well identified, so you have, you have to prove that this is true. So, uh, so this is uh, what we are doing in the developmental neurotoxicity area. We are now trying to develop a specific test, trying to incorporate in the AOP uh, framework where you can uh, have a battery of different tests to predict some of the development of neurotoxicity. And what we are doing right now is use the myelination quantification as a, one of the endpoints for the development of neurotoxicity in, in the AOPs, uh, the AOPs. But as well now, we are doing different research. And I, I, we work a little bit in SIGA, but I didn't want to, you know, you know I know you, you, you have experience in that, so I don't want to uh, touch that. But, uh, what I wanted to mention is the virus is really important. Uh, this is, these models are really important for virus studies. And why is that? Because some virus are only reproduced in humans, right? And so even if you have a rat, you will never be able to reproduce a virus. And now we have, a, and even in 2D, the infection with virus is not always possible. So there's some virus disease that we don't have any single model that we can study. Sometimes we people create a more aggressive uh, stream, so you can use it, and they have some infection. But some kind, some cases even that is really difficult. So I want to show another model that we use. I don't want to go sick, so I, I choose another virus that we study. <laughs> so we study John Kuninga virus. This is a common virus in our society. Uh, 70 and 90 percent of the humans are getting infected with this virus, and it's because of contaminated water, and it doesn't do much. So if we get infected, we have uh, maybe some uh, problems to go to the bathroom and so on, and that's it. And the problem with this virus is when we infect some patients that are immune deficient, then it produces uh, progressive multifocal encephalitis. And this is a really, really, really problem in HIV patients, right? And this model doesn't have any uh, model to study. So you cannot use anything to study this virus. And I just want to show as, as an example that we took from NIH both the wild type virus plus the uh, aggressive uh, string that is called MAD. And, and we found that in these models, in, in our uh, spheres, we can increase, uh, the, the virus is replicating. Of course, we saw more in the MAD version than in the wild type. But what I want to say is these models are really useful for virus infection, as Stephen has shown. Um, we, we did as well some studies to prove that the uh, astrocytes are the main cells that are infected by this virus. We uh, did as well for oligodendrocytes to see if the oligodendrocytes were infected and so on. 
and with this some electrical microscopy to prove that uh, we have here these guys. So, so I think that the, the, the tools that we are developing right now and the 3D culture are giving a lot of opportunities uh, for the infection uh, uh, studies, as well for other things. And I'm going to show you as well some, some of the things that we can do for cancer. We're really uh, into toxicology, as I say. Uh, so we are as well trying to work in develop tests for uh, drug development and drug screening. So what we did uh, in this project is we incorporate a glioblastoma in our spheres. Right? This is uh, four weeks. So we introduced this glioblastoma this year. Uh, is this uh, more? And after five weeks, you see that the, the glioblastoma is growing, right? And then after seven weeks, it's just taking over all the area. And the good thing is uh, we choose a uh, li uh, line of glioblastoma. This is where uh, called from a patient, but we introduce the person. We make a line that was a person. So we can track how the uh, glioblastoma is spreading over the, the organoids. So what we are doing right now together with uh, a company that is Micromatrix, uh, we can introduce one aggregate in each well with the cryo section, and then you have all these sections. And then by a software, oh, well, you have in the end, you will have something like that, right? So you can use different treatments. And, and, and by using a, a software that identifies the fluorescent cells, you can see how the cells are growing over the time. And now with the treatment, we can see how the, the, the treatment works or not and how reduce the, the tumor, right? So this is one of the things that we are going to try. Uh, I think it's almost done. But now we are working in the treatment. Uh, other the things that we are working is in the Parkinson model. I know you said it's going to talk tomorrow, so uh, I didn't want to go to give on that. We, we are using different approach of, of other people. Um, some people are using acetylene lines. In our case, we are using a treatment that produces similar symptoms that are found in Parkinson. So we use uh, 6 hydroxydopamine NPP plus and NPTP. And the idea was to see if we can affect only dopaminergic neurons by using concentration. So this was just the establishment of the model. We try to find which chemical works better, which one produces more oxidative stress, which one we can select, which concentration we should select to, to, to determine to only kill the vaminating neurons. And now we are working in the treatment to see if we can use this model to, to find drugs that protect the vaminating neurons to die. Yeah, I'm going to finish. Uh, yeah. So we incorporate as, as well the barrier in our model. Um, we uh, di di differentiate the, the notelia cells as well uh, from IPSCs. And, and, and then we incorporate, right now we are trying to make some vessels and, and put the aggregates uh, between the vessels. But it's something that is uh, going on. But with the, with the simple transfer, as I say, you can incorporate this to the drug screen. So you can put the aggregates on the lower level, the blood member in the middle, and then you put the treatment on top. And then, because uh, drug screening, the main bottleneck for drug screening is that the chemicals will not cross the bottleneck. So with this, we can incorporate both things at the same, the same time. In this case, we used to see if uh, the penetration of the different chemicals uh, will cause a disruption of the blood and barrier or what's more like a diffusion. But uh, I'm going to just so I just want to thank many people that are involved in these projects. And I want to use this special occasion because I'm in Rio to uh, to, to to say that uh, these two people from from here, Paula Emilia Correa Lady and Maria Rodriguez Pereira, came to our lab for seven months ago, and they did a, a terrific job. So if you guys have the opportunity to work with them, you should work with them. And that's it. Thank you very much.